Okay, this kind of combines uh, two chapters and uh, a lot of verses, but Steve, you're not going to have to read them all. So um, a lot of names and stuff as they are, are talking. So um, but we'll, we'll talk about that. So there, there was, I don't know, some of the uh, commentators went off on who all these people were and why they were listed there. And I... Um, I just didn't spend time on, on that part. So, but I'll point out the things that are important as that I thought were important as we go through this. Uh, so, okay, here's a warm up. Do you prefer rural, suburban, or city life to raise a family? Bye -bye. Suburban. Suburban. Yeah, suburban. suburban. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's city life can get uh, kind of a uh, crazy. Although, like I said, uh, Abby lived downtown when she was for part of the time she was going to uh, IUPUI even through her master's. But then uh, we bought her a house in our neighborhood or helped her buy a house in our neighborhood uh, during all the uh, the summer 2020. Uh we thought downtown got kind of dangerous, so didn't want her living down there during that time. Uh, okay, so. Uh, what's your idea of a musical extravaganza? <laughs> 76 trombone parade, 100 piece orchestra. Uh, the boom box kind of a <laughs> basis question. <laughs> Yeah. Half time at the Super Bowl. The Eagles. The Eagles. Yeah. yeah. And that 76 trombone kind of parade, uh, kind of, I've had quite a quick flashback to high school when we did the, uh, 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 was a music man and in our high school play. And during one of the rehearsals, the, the guy that uh, was famous in the traveling troupe, uh, well, I think in the movie, too, that played the music man. You remember him? So, so, Rustin. Yeah, I think, well, I can't remember his name, but I, I, I do remember that uh, it was the traveling thing was in town in Indianapolis, and they heard that he we were doing the music man, so he came over to our rehearsal. Uh, which you know everybody was excited about, but he was he was drunk out of his mind. <laughs> you know he was a little too uh, handsy and friendly with the uh, female people in the thing. So anyway, that was my exposure to a, a movie star or TV. What well, anyway? So so ever done a prayer walk? with a group or can you share a bit of your experience or anybody ever done a prayer walk? No. Yes. Yep. yep. I've done a prayer walk. I did it in yeah. Spain. Yeah, I did it. I, we, we used to do a retreat when I first got back here and we were, we did one that was actually part of the schedule. So. Okay. Yeah, we well, did, we did ahead. one in, uh, in Granada, Spain, it was the first one I've ever done, and it was amazing. Um, we're walking through a town of, I don't know, they call them a little village, maybe two or 3,000 people, and just praying. And some people come up with curiosity and ask what you're doing. And, but we, ironically, we met this kid. He was like 22 years old. He was a rapper. Oh, really? And a skateboarder and he was into drugs and one of the other guys started talking to him i you know i, I would have not because it was he was obviously in a strange place ended up going getting a coffee with us and kind of telling his story and it was truly amazing and um he has stayed in touch with that group uh, now for about two years, so that's pretty, pretty cool. Hmm. I 
similar story. We we are. It's a place. Uh, uh, it's called Camp Carol Halling, uh, and it's a Lutheran camp. It's that way outside of. It's out in nowhere. But as we were on our walk, there was a youth group also on the walk. But we had a young lady come up and stop us, and she was 15 and pregnant and wanted to ask us to pray for her and her baby, which was amazing. I'll never forget it. As we prayed, she cried. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, well, this is, um, this is more uh, a praise walk. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get through it in about this story uh, today. Uh, so this is your part, Rick. I even got some highlighted text here. So. Yeah. These chapters show God's offering joyful sacrifices to God, their Redeemer. He has rescued them from exile and brought them home to Jerusalem, where they are now able to live and worship safely within its walls. All this is by God's hand, and they are responding to his provision. They offer songs of thanksgiving and great sacrifices on the day, and then in the days that follow with regular songs of worship, offerings, and daily portions. The contours of the story are the contours of God's redeemed people in all times. All as Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, has come and rescued us from the slavery of sin, giving us each eternal, secure life in him. We, as God's people, continue to offer up sacrifice of praise to God with the praises of our lips and with the whole of our lives. The insider world is not our home. We have our eyes peeled to the city about to come. Um, let, let's take our place outside with Jesus, no longer pouring out the sacrificial blood of the animals, but pouring out sacrifice, sacrificial praises from our lips to God in Jesus' name. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do. Okay, thanks, Rick. All right, Steve, as you go through this, I think, I think you can discern what you need to read or so it's like on this page the only part you oh. can probably read is the first <laughs> yeah. I'm being I'm being punished. <laughs> no, it, it, it's the first it's the first three lines. And okay. read the read the large print. <laughs> oh my gosh, I gotta trade in my monitor. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. Just the first three lines on this one. All right, are you guys ready? Yeah. Now the leaders of the people stayed in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots for out of ten to come and live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while the other nine tenths remained in their towns. The people praised all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. And These just... are the heads of the provinces who stayed in Jerusalem. But in the villages of Judah, each lived on his own property in their towns. Okay, so there's a bunch of other names in here, and and uh, as you know, uh, there, there's be more names too. But um, we've been through this name names uh, uh, a list of names again. There's some similarities to earlier lists. Uh, there's reasons that uh, some of these people are are listed here, but uh, that was uh, a lot more than I think we wanted to get into. So, um, so there's differences in the names, then, huh? Yeah, slight differences, but I, okay. I didn't. I didn't spend some. Some of us was from an old list, probably maybe from Ezra, and just kind of listing the people that are there. And then there's there's people that uh, Zerubbabel uh, brought over, but then there were some more people that came into uh, town uh, for this event that were uh, <clears throat> still over in Babylon, but they had heard about it, and some of them came over for that. So. So, uh, Dwight, is this the first neighborhood association? <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that would be it. So, uh, I looked at that and said, wow, that's got to be, or, you know, you got one per they, if anything, God was here, he was organized. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that's true. So, um, and this one just probably. These are the priests and Levites who went up from Zerubbabel, son of Shiltiel, Shiltiel and with Jesus. Yeah, and just the bolded. These were the leaders of the priests and their relatives in the days of Jeshua. In the days of Jochum, the leaders of the priestly families were. In the days of Elishab, Johada, okay, Johanna and Jada, yeah. the leaders of the families and the Levites and the priests were recorded while Darius the Persian ruled. Yeah, so this this basically brings us to the end of, uh, oh, we're starting in the chapter 12. That was, This was all chapter 11. And this is uh, chapter 12. We're starting into that. And so then we get into more of the meat of it. So at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sent for the Levites, whether they lived and brought them to Jerusalem to celebrate the joyous dedication with thanksgiving and singing accompanied by cymbals, harps, and lyres. The singers gathered from the region around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Natophathites, from Bagilgal, and from the fields of Geba and Asmabeth, where they had built, had built villages for themselves around Jerusalem. After the priests and Levites had purified themselves, they purified the people, the gates, and the wall. Then I brought the leaders of Judah up on top of the wall, and I appointed two large processions that gave thanks. One went to the right of the wall toward the dung gate. Hoshia and half the leaders of Judah followed, along with Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, Jeremiah, and some of the priest's sons with trumpets, and Zechariah, son of Jonathan, son of Shemaiah, son of Mataniah, son of Micaiah, son of Zakur, son of Asaph followed, as well as his relatives, Shemaiah, Azarel, Malila, Yalala, Maya, Nathaniel, Judah, and Hanai, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God. Ezra the scribe went in front of them. At the fountain gate, they climbed the steps of the city of David on the ascent of the wall and went <clears> above <throat> the house of David to the water gate on the east. So I've got to have to we go over all this. So I think this, yeah. Okay, this is the last. The second Thanksgiving procession went to the left and I followed it with half the people along the top of the wall, past the tower of the ovens to the broad wall, above the gate of Ephraim, and by the old gate, the fish gate, the tower of Hanel, the tower of the hundred, to the sheep gate. They stopped at the gate of the guard. The two Thanksgiving processions stood in the house of God. So did I and half the officials that accompanied me, as well as the priest, Elikam, Messiah, <laughs> Miniamon, Micaiah, Elaniah, Zechariah, and Hananiah with trumpets, and Messiah, Shemaiah, El Elazir, Uzi, Uzi Jehonanan, <laughs> Malachi, yeah. Elam, and Ezard. Then the singer sang, and Jezariah as the leader. On that day, they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced because God had given them great joy. The women and children also celebrated, and Jerusalem's rejoicing was heard far away. On that same day, men were placed in charge of the rooms that housed the supplies, contributions, first fruits, and tents. The legally required portions for the priests and the Levites were gathered from the village fields because Judah was grateful to the priests and Levites who were serving. They performed the service of their God and the service of purification, along with the singers and gatekeepers, as David and his son Solomon had prescribed. For long ago, in the days of, of David and Asaph, there were leaders of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. So in the days of Zerubbabel and Nehemiah, all Israel, all Israel contributed the daily portions for their singers and gatekeepers. They also set aside daily portions for the Levites. And the Levites set aside daily portions for the descendants of Aaron. Well, thanks, Steve. I, as much as I try to keep the names out, the majority of the names, there's probably a hundred or so that you missed, but I didn't have you read. So, Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, you know, uh, Wait, we read. 
Yeah, we've read that. Okay. Yeah. All right. I didn't want to point out something here. So what do you know about David and Asaph uh, that they're referring to? Anything uh, stand out about those two names or that might tie these two names together? Okay, well, um, if you look a good portion, David wrote a good portion of the Psalms, but Asaph, uh, the singer or writer, also wrote a, a lot of the Psalms. So those are two two songs two, two psalm writers there. So I don't know. They both had uh, gold label platinum uh, in their repertoire, but uh, so yeah. Yeah, so if you look at Psalms, you'll see Asaf in there also. Um, so there wasn't too many questions that I pulled out for her, uh, a couple of these pages, but uh, here's one. Why do you think the people were so reluctant to settle in Jerusalem? It's a big target. That's yeah, a big target. Lots of maintenance, probably. Lots of maintenance. Uh, yeah, well, a lot, lot of them, you know, they were uh, they were lived in suburbia or some of the smaller surrounding communities. Some of them uh, might have been farmers uh, or sheep herders or what, whatever. So. Uh, and someone didn't want to raise their family in the big city, if you will, um, kind of like you got to give up. You got to give up something you know for something you don't know. That's the biggest. Yeah, fear. yeah, yeah. So there were some people. Well, let me see if I got. It. So why did Nehemiah and the other leaders deem it necessary to repopulate the holy city? Because otherwise, it turns into a ghost town. <laughs> city like this happened to detroit when gm collapsed um the the sub even the suburbs would population would drop and so the 7 and 11 and the subway store and the walmart couldn't keep their doors open and so everything just started collapsing in on itself it, you know, it, it takes a certain amount of use and commerce and trade to keep things moving. Yeah. Okay, so how did they get people to move into the city? Chamber of Commerce. Just... Chamber of Commerce. Casting lots. Casting right? lots, yeah. Yeah, casting lots. Yeah. There you That's go. Wow. So some some volunteered. There were some of the volunteered and uh and then others they, they cast lots. So again, I don't know whether they had the the shofar there or how we've talked about that. They did several different ways to cast lots, but uh it might have been like uh rolling dice. <laughs> So, um, and I, I, when I think about rolling dice and I don't know, you know, any of those, uh, you played the, uh, uh, the Dungeons and Dragons or any of those things in, uh, earlier in your lives, uh, you know, or whether it was a 20 sided dice or eight sided dice or anyway, so. What is the list of residents uh, versus three to 24? And again, I'm not, we didn't read that. I'll well, say about the administrative abilities of Nehemiah. Well, I, I was noticing it as Steve was beautifully reading it. Mm -hmm. I was reading through some of the parts that we didn't read and Again, it, it looks like some of them were selected and some of them were by lot, maybe. But the, he made sure he had enough of each of the required functions to make the 
you know, uh, the religious ceremonies work, right? Yeah, no. And I think that's, he's still, he's, um, as we've talked throughout this whole chapter, how, what a great administrator and leader he is on uh, his organizational skills, for one, or likely God given. Uh, but uh, so. Well, when we talk about how small these numbers are, too, in comparison to what actually came over, uh, this is a pretty select group. I mean, plus God's rules were not, you know, some people were obviously going to say, you know what, I'm happy where I'm at. Uh, so uh, it was really creating that remnant of people that were very devoted to God. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a lot of what we need to get from here. Uh, uh, so, but how do, you, how do you how do you kind of uh, align the fact that they they used, you know, lot, they used uh, the roll of die, but yet he had all these components. It sounds like to me there were two lists. There was a list that he put together, and then there was a, a you, your number came up, you got to be here. Yeah, it's kind of like... Uh finger on the scale yeah well, it was got well finger on the scale but it also might be just like a, a military service <laughs> some people volunteer and some uh wait till they're they yeah. um, so. so when they draft so when they drew these lots were they drawing them for people who had to go or who people who got to go so there were so many people wanting to go that they had to draw lots or hardly anybody wanted to go so they had to go draw lots to force them does it say which way it was I think it would be the latter, but uh, good point, though. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So we just we just assume that was the case, but I would think <clears throat> Nehemiah probably handpicked the people that needed to be there to kind of head up the different functions, right? Probably some coercion going on. Yeah, probably leaned on them a little right. bit. So. Well, yeah, if you added up the priests and the Levites and the leader of the people, that definitely didn't give him enough people. So right. they had to go outside those. So when you got those groups together, they went, okay, I got this group, but we guys, we need a lot more than that. So Yeah, if you look through the list the later, I mean, you see like 928, 822, there's somewhere there's 13, 14. So yeah. So Okay, I think on this list, yeah, no questions on this page. So, okay, dedication of the wall. What was the purpose of dedicating the wall? Giving thanks to God. Yeah, it's just kind of a celebration. Again, we, we've talked about it, just kind of uh, thrown out those uh uh, 52 weeks or whatever it was how quickly they did it how big it was and obviously you know it was high up and it was wide enough that we could have a big procession walking around the top of it so i mean that's kind of amazing we don't see um i mean in some some walls in the ancient cities i mean they could ride chariots around the top so but i'm not sure this is but it's Obviously, we're big groups going uh, around the wall. So I, I'll show you, um, I'll point out some of the points it's talking about here in the uh, in the two groups. So who were the first to be summoned to prepare for the celebration? The Levites? Here. Yeah, the Levites, and um, it looks like the, the if, you, if you read through there, the singers and uh, a lot of people that, had, I mean, just the people generally to do a worship service. But, of course, they would be singing and celebrating as they were going <laughs> around the, uh, on the walls. So, um, but the Levites, the priests were an important part of that, so. So why did the Levites need to purify themselves?
Well, I guess you have to recall your reading of Deuteronomy and that's kind of a requirement, okay. right? Yeah, it's kind of a requirement. Because uh they hadn't um uh, so that there would be the ceremonial washing washing, excuse me, Indiana war. <laughs> So you couldn't even enter the temple back then until you did this crazy cleaning routine, right? Right. So in verse 30, the priests and the Levites purified themselves. Then they purified the people. Anything similar we as Christians do to purify and cleanse ourselves to be a holy vessel for God's use. Are you referring to baptism? Baptism might be one. Uh, confession. Confession. Uh, there you go. You're right on it today, Runk. <laughs> if, if we freely freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, he is faithful and just, true to his own nature and promises, and will forgive our sins, dismiss our lawlessness, and continuously cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Everything not in conformity to his will in purpose, thought, and action. So this is kind of what the, the Levites were doing. They were cleansing themselves of un, unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, In verse 31, we see Nehemiah acting again in his role as administrator, speaking in his first-person voice. So... I mentioned that because the commentators pointed that out. Then I brought the leaders up. Do you think he organized this praise walk around the wall? Do you think he tried to send people to the parts of the wall they worked on? And if so, how do you think they felt walking or marching and singing over the part they helped rebuild? They weren't part of the walkers to the dung gate. They were probably pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I hate, he, to, he, he I hate to be appointed to that group. He, he, he did say he appointed, you know, the processions and shows which one would go right and left. So it sounds like he may have, yeah, allowed them to walk by their the pride of work and see look what I did. And yeah, so that's takes quite a bit of organization. You remember who worked on? Uh, over by the dung gate or the the southern gate or who did this part of the wall, blah, blah, blah. So, um, again, I think that would be, you know, people marching around singing and they're going, I worked on this part. So, And it's a real sense of ownership and, and you're going to be proud you built this for God. And you had something to do with it. Well, otherwise, if you're walking right and say, who did that work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, did they screw that up. Yeah. <laughs> so, so here's it. Um, they started at the Valley Gate. I got that from some other commentary. And Ezra's group went around this way. And they came, this is the group stopped here. And this was actually kind of the entry or to the temple. And then Nehemiah's group went down here, the dung gates right down here at the bottom, went past the fountain gate, the stairs from the city of David, some of those things mentioned in the passage, up around the, the great projecting tower and came up around this way. So it was, it was puzzling me for um, a while why this one group's trip was so much shorter and then as I was getting out of the shower this morning, it occurred to me that this group's trip was shorter because it included a lot of the Levites and the and the priests that were going to prepare for the worship service. So they had time to get there and, and get everything ready for the, the rest of the people coming from uh, this other path. So, although, uh, look, the circumference around the wall is... <laughs> 1.5 miles. So that wasn't a lot of time difference, but I don't know. Anyway, so they're marching around the wall. I mean, making a, a big uh, 
a lot of uh, a lot of noise in their singing and celebration. But that's the two different paths. But they allegedly started here. One group went around this way, and the other group went down by the Dung Gate and then around this way. Um, in verse 30, 43, on the day of the offering, great sacrifices rejoiced because God had given them great joy. The women and children also celebrated, and Jerusalem's rejoicing was heard far away. So in verse 33, they talk of offering great sacrifices and rejoice. What might be a counterpart for a Christian, excuse me, Christian? You're talking about tithing? No, let's see what I'm talking about. Uh, and so, dear brothers and sisters, oh. I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a li living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is the truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing. So that's kind of what the the um, the sacrifice that I was thinking about that might be similar to tie into what they're doing. Uh, <clears throat> as we read through this dedication ceremony, what sense do you have of the attitude of the people's hearts in this walk around the wall? They were grateful. They were rejoicing. They were happy to have this place back. Yeah. So I, yeah, you think about. It, I know uh, some of you and and Greg. I know your church is in the current uh, building expansion program, and those of us that maybe have, have been involved or witnessed uh, a church building. Uh, certainly, a, a lot of folks from Pilgrim when they moved locations. Uh, Christ Church uh, with the when we did that addition. So um, does that give you a sense of maybe how uh, these people might have felt? Or do you think it was similar? Um, I don't recall us walking around the ones that I've been involved in, but uh, you go into the space and you celebrate. But Well, you know, it's funny uh, that you mentioned that. I, I've done a couple of projects for, the, for New Hope, and um, they just... They're getting ready to, I think, April, uh, open up the new sanctuary, um, although they call it the auditorium, and it drives me crazy. Different issue. <laughs> uh, and they uh, they first came there in 1972, and they had a, a cross, and it's nothing special. It's actually made of aluminum, and but it's pretty big, and, and probably... 20 years ago, they, they sent it off to storage because they were going to build, you know, at that time, the new sanctuary. And, and so somebody got the idea that they would go recover this thing and put it in the, in this, in the new sanctuary. And so they called me and said, okay, this is what we want to do. We want you to build a background for it. And we want you to hang it. And, and I was thinking, you know, as you were reading all this stuff, it's kind of the same thing. You know, you're, you're celebrating a little bit of the history and um, and combining it with the new. And so when you when you bring something together again, right? In this case, they, they built the walls and built the city back up. But in, in the case of New Hope, they, they've got this new sanctuary, but they're bringing in part of the old. And so those people that are still around from the 70s and 80s that are looking at this thing, they can look at it. And, and it's much more meaningful. Right. It's the it's those those great memories of times when you rejoice the past and now you're you're rejoicing with a new set of people because a lot of people don't know what, what that cross even is. Um, so I don't know. I, I thought that was kind of. A yeah. Similar. Runk, Runk or Daryl isn't uh, that similar pilgrim. 
Definitely. The cross in the narthex came right. from the front of the church. And then on the front of the church, uh, that came from the parsonage of the church. Um, and that's that there. Well, in fact, one of the things we tried to do was pull everything together. There's a list kept in the office of everything that was dedicated. And it was all brought over. Anything that was dedicated, we tried to bring over to the church. That's cool. Cool. So some of you have, have an experience similar to what's, what's going on here. I think uh, they brought a lot of the things from the, the Old Test temple that they were able to rescue or somebody stored for them. Um, and uh, as we, we talked, when they even rebuilt the walls, there was... Uh, they used them. They, the walls were knocked down, so they just kind of used some of the old stuff to uh, to rebuild it. Oh. Wait, wait, where am I? It's kind of funny how we <laughs> we still this day use those kind of practices when you think about you know weddings, right? When daughters are trying to bring something old with them when they get married, right? Whether it's something from a grandmother or great grandmother or what have you, right? Something meaningful. So it's kind of funny how this continues in our traditions today even though it's not you know just interesting yeah exactly so it's biblical uh, yes it's, <laughs> it's a biblical tie right so many biblical ties that people do and don't realize that that's where you know that's where it was captured or started yeah so yeah i, I that kind of amazes me too as i i look and you uh just heard again some Somebody uh, that I follow was kind of going through the whole thing about the uh, the marriage ceremony, which has been, you know, throughout the, the Israelite Jews history, but how all the references about Christ and his bride and that are throughout. I mean, how, I mean, it's just uh, amazing. Uh, I think somebody was talking about the Song of Solomon. Again, it's not. You read it, and actually, I kind of uh, abused that when I was uh, a teenager because I'd give quotes from Solomon to my girlfriend, but so it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, 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 I am a little bit embarrassed admitting that, but, um, but what when you read the Song of Solomon, it's a very intimate. Uh, love relationship and what solomon says to her and what she says to him and and it's all around the marriage thing and how important that whole the history of the jewish marriage um <clears throat> is set up even from the the fact that he the 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 groom goes and pays the bride price and then he leaves the so they're in, they're engaged they're so he prays the bride price. Then he goes and he leaves and he goes back to his father's house. Oh, I'm getting emotional about this. And he he builds a place for her in his father's house. And he doesn't. He he does he does he's not the one that determines when he's done building the place for his bride. The father says. The son says, "It was is this." Is this is this what I need? Is this everything good? And the father says, no, not yet, son. And he continues to build and work on it until the father says, yes, that's great. Go and get your bride. So, so anyway, so that, yeah, a lot of that tradition and really understanding what uh, the God's plan and what Christ did for us in a lot of these uh, traditions and the history. Uh, you know, you think I think about if you didn't do this um, kind of celebration and praise, and um, I I think you know I'm, I'm old enough. I've been through several of these you know building projects that culminate and then they have a dedication service, and I always have an attitude before the service of eh, I don't know if I want to go. It's kind of stupid, but then when you go, you really enjoy it. You know, and you you celebrate the fact that, you know, all the funds came together and all the people worked hard and, and you know, there, there's a lot of dedication and sweat, toils and tears to do it. And the, you know, the gift and grace 
that God provided to make it happen. Um, and so it's, you know, this is a great example of how you gathered the people, the people that didn't necessarily want to be there, and then they're all celebrating over, you know, what God has, has given them. Um, so without that celebration and acknowledgement of what God has given you, what would it be, right? It would yeah. just be a building. It would just be a rock, a stone on top of a stone. Yeah, so this was, and you know, I'm trying to imagine this in question 12. What is your impression of the wall, the size and width with the people celebrating and doing a praise walk around it? So, I mean, that's something that uh, for me is kind of hard to imagine because when you think about walking along a wall, I don't know, is there, there were edges on the either side or you, you just kind of skinny and going along there because uh, it's not very wide, but... Um, that's just uh, kind of hard for me to comprehend that they probably are walking around with banners and streamers and singing and playing musical instruments. And uh, I mean, if it was, if it was too narrow, then people are going to have to be watching as they're playing whatever uh, instruments they're playing that they don't misstep and fall off the wall. So I don't know. That's just, uh, I, I don't think uh, it's difficult for us, for me. To, to kind of comprehend how, how wide that was, how big it was, how high up were they? Did they have a safety rail? Like you look at, uh, and I th think about uh, Darwin every time I drive downtown and, you know, the, the temporary structures they put on the, the different floors as they build up so that people don't fall off while they're building that thing. So, um, yeah. So anyway, that's just something that just kind of struck me a little bit. So, like the, that question makes me think, how big does the wall have to be to celebrate it? In other words, I think we don't celebrate so many things because we, we think it's insignificant, but reality is it isn't, right? Yeah, well, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so I got some things in the... Uh things to think about we'll get to those in a minute there's uh oh what what steps of appreciation do people take to ensure that those who serve at the temple priests levite singers and gatekeepers are cared for so this is kind of support of the levites ministry and if you uh so on the same day men were placed in charge of the rooms that house supplies contribution first fruits and tents. The legally required portions for the priests and Levites were gathered from the village fields because Judah was grateful to the priests and Levites who were saving. They performed the service of their God and the service of purification along with the, the singers and gatekeepers as David and his son Solomon prescribed uh, for. So anyway, this kind of, uh, the, the sense was in, in this is that the, uh, for your ministerial staff and the people that serve in your your church or your your temple, your congregation, um, they that set aside things to support and to take care of those people and provide for their needs. So, yeah, they also set aside daily portions for the Levites, and the Levites set aside daily portions for the descendants of Aaron. So, any other thoughts on that? Okay, so this, this, I guess this one is just for you to kind of think about. Uh, would you be willing to relocate to the inner city, maybe forsaking your chosen field or ancestors' home to be of greater use to God and his kingdom? Um, which some of those people obviously had to do if they were, or they could have refused, I guess. But um, so this one is something uh maybe to think about you remember back in uh nehemiah chapter two is that he really wanted to get a survey for the state of the wall and and things so a uh, part of the time he, he did a walk at night around the wall and uh you, you gotta i got well you don't have to think but anyway you cut 
maybe wonder how does this compare to the grand procession here? What's a before and after story could you write from Nehemiah's diary? Have you seen anything or experienced anything like that in your life? Like the difference between Nehemiah walking around the wall in chapter two and then this grand procession here. Yes. Yeah. I, you know, I think probably he would have, uh, like any of us, if you're looking at a bunch of rubble, you probably have a vision of what you think it's going to, what it's going to look like. And then the final procession when it's done is we hope that, you know, your vision matches what you thought it should look like in the end. Yeah. Yeah. When you were, you were going through that question. White, and I thought of the movie The Bridge Over River Kwai. Oh, yeah. And when Alec Guinness's character first gets there and he's, you know, he says <clears throat> that they're they're trying to build this rail bridge, he walks to it and looks at it, and it's, you know, it's terrible and it's in the wrong place and all these things. And then at the end of the movie, he's walking with the same Japanese commander over the bridge that they built. And, I, you know, so it's there's a there's a real similarity here between this biblical story and, and how they put that movie together and how they, they wrote the story of the bridge over the river quad. That's interesting. Yeah. At least to me. Sorry. No, no, it is. Interesting. It is interesting, except they had to blow it up later. I don't, I don't think well, that. and that's what I was thinking about, you know, <laughs> that they they celebrated it. But and he finally realized what he had done. So, yeah. So, all right, I'll read through these. And certainly as I read through some of these things to think about, if you have any comments or thoughts, just to jump in. So, so all citizens want to live in some region of a strong nation, a nation whose government serves its citizens. A strong nation or government will follow the compass of morality and righteousness, establishing true justice throughout the land. A government controlled by more righteous laws will develop a strong economy to provide jo jobs and a sufficient livelihood for its citizens. Moral and righteous laws will make provision for the strong protection of the nation's citizens, allowing them to live in peace and security. Moral and just laws will also assure the property and lives of the nation's citizens are protected from destruction and theft like what Nehemiah and Ezra have been trying to establish in Jerusalem. And, you know, part of what I sent out in the email earlier on discussing the law and God's law and precepts and how it, it helps establish a government controlled by moral and righteous laws. So uh, this portion of the commentary really uh, struck to me and tied, in, tied into what I, I sent out earlier. So... Do you agree or disagree? And I guess, do you agree or disagree with some of the things I said in that last email about how God's laws and precepts are a good basis for a strong nation, a prosperous nation? Yeah, that's that's. I think that's what has made the United States a shining light on the hill. You know, a special special place place where uh, 10,000 people a day want to be. Yeah. To work towards this, Nehemiah and the Israelites made uh, three basic commitments, three very basic, basic commitments. First, they sought to rebuild by making a commitment to God's word in chapter 8. Second, they sought to rebuild by making a commitment to seek revival. And third, they sought to rebuild through making a covenant, an agreement of commitment to the Lord. Any thoughts on those? Other thoughts? Uh, thought one, seeing the names of these leaders who tackled the massive problems is a strong reminder that godly leaders are needed to establish and strengthen any city or society. Without strong leadership, no people can thrive, not for long. A people's economy, culture, society, government, and judicial system suffer enormously without strong leadership. 
Godly leaders are desperately needed within every community, city, state, and nation of this world. Listen to what God's holy word says about godly leaders. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, the one who rules righteously, who rules in the fear of God. And Isaiah says, uh, woe to those enacting crooked statutes and writing oppressive laws to keep the poor from getting a fair trial and to deprive the afflicted among my people of justice so that widows can be their spoil and they can plunder the fatherless. That just so much of this got to me as I was reading it. But, but to the resettling of Jerusalem, there's a strong lesson for us. We must serve the most needed places. Within the church, all kinds of needs exist. There is a need for ministers of the gospel and host of associate workers. There is a constant need for people to count the offerings, to maintain the property and building, to serve as technicians, musicians, and security men. In addition, office staff, ministerial staff, teachers, and volunteers are needed. Think of all who serve in the committees of the church and reach out to visit the shut-ins, the hospital lives, and the lost and unchurched in the community. Just within the local church, a great range of needs exists that must be filled by both volunteers and professional ministers. So we, uh, another application is we don't need to wait to be chosen for a task. Instead, we take initiative and volunteer to do what needs to be done. Let us all learn from them and have a here I am, send me attitude. What kind of things can you celebrate with other believers? When we are following God's will, there are a lot of reasons to celebrate. How can we purify ourselves? And we talked about that in the lesson too. Uh, okay. In the updates, new things. Yeah, praise. Um, uh, Anna's been trying to get this okra fish infusion and after many, many calls and asking for help from all over the country, she is scheduled today to get her infusion. So awesome. Praise, yeah. praise, praise the Lord. Praise Lord. Very good. Wonderful. So we still have that other appointment to pray about, right, Greg? Yeah. Yeah, that's still November 2nd. <laughs> wow. Oh. But Wow. All right. So Casey had his uh, gallbladder surgery, uh, came through that pretty well, I guess uh, about a 90 minute surgery. So he's kind of, uh, he can't lift his kids or anything for a while, but uh, he's uh, doing well. Um, any update on John Kniep? I don't know. I haven't got any emails on that. His back surgery, I'm assuming he might be home. Um, uh, my daughter and her Social Security, she she lost that. I mean, we, we got looking at her pay, and I don't, she's just kind of irresponsible. Um, and she, I don't know, over a two-year period, she exceeded the amount by $20, $30. Um, and so they, they just canceled. Uh, so... It looks like we're, we're going to be paying her rent for a year or so, plus whatever. So anyway, but at least she's, oh. So now she there's a few other things. Uh, she's out working to pay some paperwork so she doesn't have to pay back all the amount over the, whoa. Uh, that uh, since she was in, from when she was in violation. So uh, again, it was, there's some months where she had uh, three pay periods in a month, and so she was definitely over on those months. But yeah, she needed to keep a closer tack on that uh, because obviously her employer wasn't. And uh, some of the times when she worked more hours than she knew she was supposed to do is because her employer in, in that case had uh, kind of threatened her, well, we need you to work these hours, so uh, or you'll lose your job. So. But that doesn't make any difference on the uh, Social Security. So uh, that's where we are. I'm just I'm just blessed we're able to uh, uh, help her financially in that regard. So, um, so 
again, uh, Debbie had her surgery yet? Yeah, she had it Wednesday. Uh, she's, a, she's still in a lot of pain. Um, uh, but, you know, when you go, you got two different versions. One person says, you know, when you get this, it'll be a little while. You don't expect to feel, you know, perfect right away. And then she had a doctor just before that she went into surgery. And I think it was kind of kidding or tongue in cheek, but she took him seriously. He said, well, you know, after the surgery, you're going to be up and going the next day and you'll be able to walk, be no problem. And it hasn't been that at all. So now she's <laughs> disgusted with the doctor that told her she was going to be able to just get up and run around. So she's still, she's with a walker. I think she's going to be fine, but you know, it's post operating, you know, syndrome where you're going to be sore and hurt and, that kind of thing. So I think we're going to be fine. Uh, but she got two different messages. And so, and now I'm recalling again, the person that said that, you know, she was going to be sore was a nurse, was not a doctor's. So she was taking the doctor's word more than the nurses. And, yeah. uh, but I, I will tell you many, many years ago when you didn't know if you were having twins or not, when we had twins in my family, uh, the nurse, we came into the hospital and the nurse looked at me and said, you know what? you're going to have twins and, and the doctor chewed her out right in front of me saying, don't be telling him that they, they're not going to have twins. I can only hear one heartbeat. So I wiped it off my mind and, you know, you know, a few hours later, I find out I had twins. So <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the nurse knew more than the doctor. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anything to add, um, anybody? Any other comments? Uh, I just continued prayers for Braden, um, my mentee. He's really struggling. He, he just turned 16. He took off last week, uh, Friday, and didn't show up back home until Sunday night. They don't know where he went. He's missed 10 days of school already this semester. Wow. It's, it's I don't know. He's really struggling. I don't have the answer. Um, Dwight, I have a book you should, I read it this week. It's called The Letter to the American Church. It's all you. You got to read it. It's about me? It's all <laughs> your beliefs. You. It, it's actually about, uh, I'll just give you a snippet. Uh, it's Dietrich Bonhoeffer's letter he wrote back in his sermon that he, he did in 1932 and how Hitler was preparing to destroy the church and have the Reichstag church instead of the uh, uh, having the Kaiser Wilhelm Cathedral and, and how Valkyrie, if you saw the movie Valkyrie, where uh, these uh, people that were against Hitler were going to try to kill him, and they, the bomb went off. It didn't kill uh, Hitler, and Hitler uh, then rounded up 7,000 people, and of the 7,000, 5,000 were executed. Uh, and Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one of those 5,000. But it's how he recognized what was happening long before the other people in Germany did. And how they how he was going to destroy the church. Yeah, and I you know, I think if or some of those discussions too, I mean, if if the majority of churches had recognized that and what was going on and what was coming, uh, and gotten together uh, rather than being in the minority, uh, they could have uh, stopped some of that stuff going on. So right. They they get into there's a chapter on silence. You know, you see this going on as a Christian and you don't do anything. And it makes makes a point that when you're silent and you don't say anything, it's just as much sin sometimes when you speak up. But those people that just let it happen, that was more of a sin than not. So it's it's uh, the author is Eric and it's M.A. I think it's two T's, maybe one. Taxes, Matt Taxes, Eric Matt Taxes. And it's the... Uh, it's only 139 pages, the book, so it's a really quick read, but uh, it's a good book. Okay, I'll look it up. 
letters to American Church. Yes, it's you, you'll enjoy. I know you're going to enjoy it. I was thinking <laughs> of you all the time I was reading it. So, uh, yeah, he's so. done a number of books. Uh, Saint Paul. He did Luther. Yeah. He, he uh he's a very prolific writer on religious items yeah and, and, and you're right when i started reading it, i thought well you know i'm gonna pick this up and i'll finish it out this week i i couldn't put it down it just really it flows just perfectly oh all right so let's spend a moment in prayer and then if we have yeah well, we'll just spend a moment in prayer that's some dear father we thank you for the things you've done for us this week and the, the surgeries have gone through the, the things that needed to be done that uh, you've made happen. And uh, we're just grateful father for that. I have some other things, uh, father that are still languishing. And I guess if it's, uh, uh, we're not complaining, but father, we just, uh, if it gives us some assurance that you've heard us and that you're working on it, uh, we'd appreciate it. Uh, we're not very patient people and, uh, sometimes we just need that reassurance there, just to let us know you're you're there. Let the people that are are suffering, are struggling, uh, Father, just uh, uh, be there for them and reach out to them. Um, we, we think of our our youth today, especially Brandon and and the kids that are struggling. They're getting so many uh, different signals from different people. They're trying to find their place in society and in the world. And Father, we just uh, ask you to lead them to a good place. So bring the, thank you for bringing um, good mentors to those that need mentors like Greg Weddle and, uh, and his mentor, oh. Brandon. And um, Father, we just ask you continue to bring the right people into people's lives that uh, need a good guide. Uh, and we focus, Father, just on, on the Holy Spirit who's also our guide and just help us listen uh, to him and what he has to say. Um, we, we ask for your blessings and protection on us all. Thank you, God. 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 Father, we, um, we continue to lift up Israel and, and what's going on over there. We ask for your continued protection and provision as as you promised uh, countless times in scripture. We also pray for our, our, our nation, Father, and um, the turmoil that uh, we can expect in this election year and, and the uh, hatred and the vitriol that uh, is so present uh, between uh, the conflicts between the parties and different opinions. And uh, Father, we just ask uh, for your blessing and, and guidance. We ask for you to come, Lord Jesus. Uh, especially now, and help restore America to uh, a land or country that's uh, following you and your will. We ask all these things in the name of uh, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.